Hello, hello. Good morning. And we are live. Cool, right. All right. I'm just going to bring in the chat here. Cool. Dopamine draw. Hey, how's it going? Um, hopefully you can see the screen and you can hear me all right. We are about to start in just a second. Alrighty, I'm just bringing my um, Epic Pen in case I need to, to show you guys something. But other than that, I think we are ready to go. Perfect. Great. Alrighty then. Uh, today is going to be about detailing this call or you know we still have to refine it a little bit and, and, and detail it. Uh, we're probably going to create some some alphas, some custom alphas. Um, hopefully we'll get to do a quick retopology using Siri Mesha. Uh, it's gonna be a rather complex object just because for for zero just because of the the holes and and the and the loops that we did here, uh, but other than that, it should be a pretty pretty straightforward uh, retopology. So we're gonna do that project details and, and all that uh, subdivide and then add more details. That's the idea for today. Uh, so it's gonna be a pretty repetitive process. Uh, I'll do I'll do my best to show you um, you know the workflow and, and certain tips and tricks that um, I think might be useful. But because it's a, a very repetitive process, it might get a bit boring. Um, so in that case, uh, if I'm going to jump into a, you know, like I said, a, a very, like the same thing over and over, um, I have a, I have a little app here called Pretzel that, um, just plays some random music without any, um, what do you call it? Like copyright or anything so we can play it here. Um, so it's going to be just a, a pretty chill session today. Um, and I just want to test it before we get started and see if you guys can hear it. So I'm going to play very quickly something, whatever is in the list. Let me know if you can hear this. Hey Berg, how's it going? Hey Side Effects, let me know if you can hear that the music. Um, I'm just testing it and see if uh, um, for some blank areas we can, um, we can just play that. It should work. Maybe I'll just crank it up a little bit. How about now? You guys can hear it? Let me know in the chat if you can hear the music. And then we'll start. Cool. Thanks, mate. All right. Uh, what name is the app? Um, it's this one here. It's called Pretzel, as in the pretzel that you will eat. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's just I'm just playing around. Ra There's a bunch of lists here, just playing something random, uh, just to have some background music, really. Cool, cool. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with the. If you remember last stream, what we did, we we sort of like combine certain pieces and we redynamize with a relatively high resolution. So we have, if I go into solo mode, we have the, the main part of the skull, right? And we have the jaw and the teeth, the upper teeth and the, and the bottom teeth. Um, these ones are the only ones. So if I turn off dynamic, these are the only ones that are sort of, or they already have some kind of um, a decent topology to work with. So all I did was turn them to dynamic and that's why they look smooth, but that's it. All right, so I'm gonna continue with this one. I'm gonna go into solo mode. And if you remember what we did last time, um, I, I gave you a little hint of what this process would would be like, um, just sort of like combining. So that's that's the main part of, or the main focus of today is uh, working on the transition. 
there's certain things that I'm gonna try to capitalize on and you know take advantage of like for instance uh, this line here so this could sort of like I can enhance that uh, to try to resemble that uh, coronal uh, such suture is it suture I don't know how to say it uh, the crack on the on the on the side of the skull the, the coronal crack here so I could just try to you know accentuate things like that uh, but other pieces for example for example these ones right here they look they, they don't look natural they, don't, they look very very precise uh, so unless I do something about it it would it wouldn't look right so these are the type of things that I, I need to make sure that are um, being you know being taken care of um, and other things like for example this one you can clearly see the tube right so this is the the tube that we used last time so the idea again today is to take these things and make sure that they blend nicely and and they, they feel part of the of the whole so it's not just a bunch of uh, you know kit batch pieces um, but that's that's the idea so for that I'm just gonna utilize a couple of brushes so I'm gonna show you the ones I'm gonna use and then I'm gonna just like I said kind of like go through the motions because it's very repetitive let me see the chat hey Ko, hey how you going man not sure if it's the the same person that I'm thinking of but welcome anyway <laughs> um, alright so I'm gonna use my my sharp knife uh, sharp con control knife so this is allows me to do very very sharp cuts like this right um, and it's, it's a it's a custom brush that I did based on on a couple of brushes well based on a brush and then I sort of like tweaked it a little bit to create a couple of brushes and this one comes with the um, digital clay pack um, which in case you don't you don't know you can go to the serious guides and, and get it there uh, but in case you don't have it uh, you can very much do the same thing with the damn standard brush it's just it's as you can see it's less um, it's, it's, it's not as strong so that's why I have this one here um, I also have a custom brush called well the extra standard so this is a custom brush based on the standard brush I'll show you what this one does so it's pretty simple pretty similar uh, the difference is that it has a lot of ra lazy radius, so it's super control way to create these these shapes. Maybe I'll show you here, right? So I can do these sort of um, effects or um, details with the same with the same brush, right? In a single motion, because it gives you a lot of control, and it has obviously more. Um, uh, it's stronger than the than the standard brush. That's why I call it the extra one. Um, now. One thing about this brush that I should mention is that for for the most part I would use this, you know, to to add this type of details with a very controlled motion. But if I turn off lazy mouse, so in other words, getting rid of that control um, use of this brush, the, the effect is really strong. So it also it's also very useful to to do this, you know, more detailed stuff. You, know, you can create a quick brain effect just by doing that. Right, and again, this is just the standard brush um, with some tweaks. You know, stronger than the than the usual one. So there you go. That's another one. Another one that I might be using is the, or that I actually am going to be using quite a bit is the custom my custom clay builder brush. And this is just the normal clay builder brush with a few adjustments. So that the the alpha, although it's using the same alpha, this square alpha is not as obvious. Uh, so that's another one that I'm going to be using and I have the smooth strong as well um, I think the normal smooth should be fine let me just check yeah normal smooth brush should be fine but if I want something stronger I have the smooth strong here with me and I also have the smooth peaks and the smooth smooth valleys in this sort of custom palette um, I'll show you very quick what the smooth peaks does so if I have something like this I can bring in the smooth peaks and when I smooth, Sirius is going to respect sort of like these small crevices. So this one is really good when, when we start adding like smaller details so that we can create that porosity of the, like to simulate bone or like a bony surface. I'm going to undo that. Um, there's still some leftovers from the, um, 
from the previous object when we before we dynamesh. So you can see some faceted polygons, but that's just um, you know that's the that's part of the of the process anyway. So here, for example, you can see in this area this tube, but it's just a matter of smoothing it and and it should be fine. Uh, I'm going to show you also a pretty cool technique here to to detail and and, and work on these areas that are pretty hard to reach. Um, just to make it really easy. Cool. <laughs> Nicholas, no worries, mate. The, this one is called um, Epic Pen. So uh, it's a it's a free app that allows you to draw on screen. I I use it a lot for um, for my classes online, um, especially during the the extra mile. And oh, by the way, some of you guys uh, asked me the um, series for Illustrator's course is is open, so you guys can. Um, can grab that if you're interested and anyway uh, I just remember because I also use it in that so in all my online classes I use this to to explain certain things but it's also a really cool app um, to take screenshots so like if you're working and uh, you figure something out that is cool you can just you say oh this is how you go into solo mode or whatever and then just take a screenshot with this button and it will save it to the um, to the desktop so it is a pretty cool app epic pen I'll put it here That's the that's the app that I'm using. All right, let's get to it. No worries, Nicholas. All right, so I'm gonna start with the clay buildup, and again, this this is all about um, refining the the transitions on the surface. Oops, I need to make sure I have my smooth brush, not the smooth picks. And I don't want to completely remove the that idea of like you know having a, a different surface because it, it's going to make it a bit more bumpy in a way. And I'll show you another way to to judge surface in in just a little bit. So really, the the workflow here is just try to um, stay true to the design that you have in mind. Uh, which in my case, I'm sort of like like I said, winging it. <laughs> but if you have a reference, definitely. Keep looking at the references. Uh, this is when you start refining the the shapes, right? So, in other words, making sure that everything feels like a single piece. And I have symmetry enabled at the moment. Uh, we're gonna get rid of symmetry at some point, but for this refinement process, um, it's better to keep it keep it simple. Unless you have something definitely very very different from one side to the other. So. Again, the, the, the workflow is pretty simple. All I'm using is the custom clay builder brush, but you can use the one that comes with ZBrush. It, this, it really doesn't matter. Um, this is something that I also get asked quite a bit, like in terms of customizing UI and customizing your, your brushes and that sort of thing. Um, the only reason I customize brushes, I have, let's say I have two levels of customization. So the only reason I customize brushes, let's say the first level, would be to work faster and to suit my workflow a little bit better. Um, the other one is for detailing, which is for the same purpose, right? It's to speed up process. But it doesn't mean that because you have a custom brush, you will be better at it <laughs> or better at creating details. So um, it's just being faster, really, in, in certain things. And, and some of the time, especially with this kind of like second level of customization, which is the what I would say is the, the the details. It gives you the the ability to um, to find mistakes or or produce little crevices and yeah the little details that you might not get otherwise. And based on those, you can continue the refinement. So in other words, it's kind of like an exploration having those uh, those brushes there. But as you can see, it is just a matter of using the clay builder brush or the custom one in this case. Um, and then the smooth brush, just to keep everything, maintain everything very, very clean as you as you work. Uh, and this is what I'm saying. This is not detailing. And what we did before, which you know, it looks pretty. I mean, it looks detailed enough, but it's not details because when you're doing this and you're refining these surfaces, and you're using the smooth brush, you're ultimately removing some of those uh, apparent details that you created. So that's why it's uh, it's important to. Keep it in mind that what you did before 
uh, let's say if you you follow in the same workflow that I'm doing here, it's not necessarily details because it's going to be overridden. Right, so that's um that's the goal at this stage. Hopefully you can see. I should have saved actually, but mm. yeah, I can show. You. Let's um, I mean this one is I think it's pretty obvious, but what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna store a morph target, and I'm gonna work on another area so that when I do the the switch between the morph targets, it's gonna be pretty obvious for you guys what I'm what I'm trying to achieve here. And like I said, it doesn't mean that refining the surfaces unless it's something that you want, it's doing this, right? Like com completely combine them together. Like I can I can use a little bit of this and then, um, you know, maybe the, the top area. It's, it's a single piece, right? Or it, it should feel a bit more solid, but the rest necessarily, not necessarily, I don't know. This is part of what the, the design process is all about as well. I'm just gonna smooth it a bit. I think this one here needs to be quite prominent, the difference. And of course it's just a creature skull, it's nothing, not like a realistic one of course, but um, uh, it's good to keep the design grounded. So certain anchor points that, you know, even though you might not be familiar with with the anatomy of a of a skull or like the the skeleton um you might recognize some some bits of realism there in other words like if if you think about it um if you're working for a for for the movie industry so you know video games and and that sort of thing and you're designing for for that industry um the people that consume the the content like you're creating it, but the people that consume the content, they don't have to know about anatomy. They don't have to know about, you know, why is this call like this or that sort of thing. They just, um, you know, it's entertaining, right? So, I mean, that's that's one thing, but you kind of like need to create something that when they see it, when the audience see the product, it sort of feels um, that it could exist, even though they have no idea why it could exist. And one of the ways that you can achieve that is creating these sort of anchor points. Um, even though it's very alien, like the shape is not real or anything, um, there are certain things that you look at it and it's like, okay, it's familiar. It's, uh, I feel I feel that I've seen this before. I feel that it could exist in the world. And that's also why um, things like, you know, certain creatures that are aliens or, you know, in the yeah, alien movies and that sort of thing, they are, um, even though they're very weird creatures or very alien, <laughs> they they feel familiar somehow. So they have they have knees, right? <laughs> like you know, if if it's an alien from a different world, there's no suggestion that um, they would have knees or that sort of thing. So just by doing these these anchor points to reality, uh, I, I guess you create a, a design that is more believable, like more plausible. And that's that's what the the whole point of this, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is what all this um, sculpting needs to it needs to reflect that idea. All right, so these lines still feel a little bit weird. I think I'm gonna just blend them here at the end. Um, and remember that you also have the old um, the old key, right? So not everything is additive, or not not the whole uh, sculpting process is additive. You can also use the alt key to sort of push things in. And it's a, you know, it creates a nice contrast as well when you do it every now and again. All right. I think that feels a bit better. This is still yeah, looks pretty manufactured. So I think what I'm gonna do is bring in the knife brush and then just do some more organic lines here. Something like that. And just based on those lines, I can go ahead and 
bring the clay brush again and refine some transitions that have that feel a little bit more organic like I said not necessarily you know a straight line but this is also um, what I just did there it's kind of like the design choices like the aesthetic choices that you make as you as you produce the the refinement and the transitions of these shapes so it, you know things can change quite a bit that's why I keep everything at a dynamic with a high resolution at this at this stage before committing to anything because uh, the refinement you know will throw in some some interesting shapes some additional things that you might not um, you you yeah you were intended to do okay so I think that this transition of the shapes feel they feel a little bit more fit better a bit better maybe here needs a bit of maybe push things in a bit more create kind of like a like a valley here or a fossa right so something like that and then of course with the knife brush or the damp standard brush like I said it doesn't really matter it's whatever works for you um, just help to accentuate certain lines but always using the, the smooth brush at this point so keeping everything very very clean or relatively clean I mean uh, it's gonna be you know we might have to sharpen these these details and, and make things a bit um, softer when when we combine it with the uh, serial mesh or once we do the the projection of those details all right cool so um this is a probably a good point to show you the difference since i um i saved a morph target so i saved the the previous state of the model before we did all of these details so if I switch, so you'll see this is uh, what we had before, uh, the result of creating all of those, let's uh, let's call it kit bashing, but it's not really, although it's similar. Um, yeah, so we have a pretty defined set of pieces here. And again, these are just, it's part of the process and it's the result of what we did in the in the first the first stream, right? Um, but now, if I switch, right, and to toggle this off, now even though the the main shapes, the primary shapes are there, there are some secondary forms and some volumes that are sort of integrating everything together, and that's the idea, really. I'm gonna delete the the morph target now. And just move to another part, another part of the skull. Um, let's have a look. Um, hey, Viviana. Hello. This is this looks so advanced to me. <laughs> uh, there's nothing advanced. I mean, depending on what your uh, what you what's your stage right now at the moment in in ZBrush. Um, but all we're doing is just using the clay builder brush and and the smooth brush to add volumes um, so no, not a lot of uh, complexity at this this stage um, B can you explain your experience with first starting with zero struggles and how over and how you overcame it um, yeah I could talk about a little bit about that uh, there is there are actually two videos specifically about that um, that you know more kind of like more in-depth <laughs> and uh, edited so that I don't because um, if I start telling it uh, right now it's I can just you know go on and on um, and that's something that I tend to do <laughs> I just like you know branch out and just talk about random stuff uh, but if you go to the uh, Sivers Guides website there is at the top so com. if you go at the very top uh, menu there is the first one I think it's called uh, start here and that's it's a it's a space of the website or a or a page dedicated to um yeah to new artists in ZBrush really 
So if you go there and you scroll down to the bottom or near the, near the bottom, you'll find a couple of or, or two links to a couple of videos about specifically about that. So I talk about my experience and how I how I decided to learn ZBrush, why I learned ZBrush, uh, what are the practical steps that I took and how I documented my process and yeah, what are the practical steps that I that I took to to learn Sibrish and what I what I struggled with and all of that. So I think that's probably better <laughs> than me just talking about it. But um, very briefly, as a quick summary, when when I first was introduced to Sibrish, it was Sibrish the f second version of Sibrish when it was still a an illustration, mainly 2.5D illustration software. And it was incredibly frustrating for me, because um, at the point, at that point, um, I was studying, and all I knew really of 3D was um, Maya when it was still Alias. So I only knew Maya um, as a 3D software. Uh, we at, at university, at a, a university level, we were still um, modeling or doing box modeling with a software that is free and I still think that is even a, a fantastic software called uh, Wings 3D. So that was kind of like my introduction to the world of uh, 3D modeling, not necessarily sculpting. Um, so I use Wings 3D, I use Maya, uh, you know, very early, very early version of Maya. Um, what else? I think it was just mainly those two uh, for 3D. And uh, and Photoshop, All right? So those were like my my software or the software that I used to um, to work with at uni uh, when I was learning 3D and everything. Um, but the point is that was kind of like my experience. So the first time that I saw ZBrush or that I got introduced to ZBrush, um, it was it was like a revelation, really. It was really, really interesting. But the first time that I tried it, um, I felt like, you know, it was it was not for me. Although I really wanted to use it, it was pretty frustrating. Uh, and the reason I think that's uh, that was the case is because um, of my experience with all the 3D applications and, you know, modeling and, and what I thought about modeling and, and that sort of thing. So in other words, I was, I had this preconceived idea of what uh, 3D or 3D in general should be, and what the, the workflow should be, and uh, and all that. So at the time, for me, it was it was kind of like a like an interesting gimmicky software because it didn't do like fully 3D and it didn't do fully 2D. Um, it was kind of like a middle ground between what I already knew, which was Photoshop, and I was pretty comfortable with it, and Maya or or Wings 3D. So it was a it was a it was a long le learning curve for me. Now that that was one thing. Now the other thing is that um, at that time, that's when, and this is honestly the reason why I think sort of Sirush uh, became such a powerful, such a powerhouse in the industry. Um, it was because of the of the use and the introduction of the normal maps. So uh, I remember well, I, I had to study these papers about the the normal maps. So the, the papers that were introduced in SIGGRAPH 2000, I don't know, I think it was 90 something, or maybe 2000, I can't, I can't remember. There was like a couple of papers uh, from SIGGRAPH about normal maps and, and what they wear and all that. And they were pretty new to me and to the industry as well. At the time I was using just bomb maps. That was that's the that was the way that you detail stuff back in the day or adding details um, without having crazy topology. So um yeah so when the normal maps were introduced it was like a any you know I mean imagine imagine not having normal maps right now <laughs> for, for games and things like that and, and then all of a sudden they get introduced and you know it was mind blowing um anyway the point is that at the time Sirush was probably the the best and I, th I think it still is one of the best um software to produce normal maps and and you know and being able to manipulate them and, and visualize them and that sort of thing so um because of that reason 
ages ago, I started to uh, to use it more as a and and it was using it purely as a for that part of this of the process, right? So I wanted to generate some so normal maps, but I would do all my modeling and all the the sculpting, let's say, in Maya and and Wings 3D. Uh, I had a friend in uh, at uni that was uh, it was really really good, really really good in um, so sort of like box modeling and he could create like these really organic shapes just by pushing points right um, and anyway so I sort of like followed him and followed his path a, a little bit in in that sense but I wanted to do something a bit more organic something that I felt a bit uh, more natural rather than literally pushing points uh, from a cube so um, I started, so that's kind of like a quick summary. I started with uh, using ZBrush. It was 2.5 maybe at the time, uh, just as a tool to produce the normal maps that I needed because there was literally not much or not other uh, simple options at the time. I think normal uh, X normal was introduced short after, I can't remember. But um, yeah, the point is that at first, it was kind of like, nah, um, this is not for me. This is just a this is just a tool for for normal maps. But then, of course, um, I realized that you know that wasn't that wasn't the case. And what I needed was to just sort of like drop that that mentality and and that um, yeah that preconceived idea of what three D and and modeling should should be like. Um, you know. Could not, not necessarily like, um, hang on, let me just inflate here. I'm going to do a quick redynamic again. Just to close that gap in there. Um, so yeah, not, not necessarily something that, uh, you know, you will, that you would struggle with, that you just need to, to pass that, that threshold. Um, and once you understand how things work, because that's, you know, that's, Generally speaking, what what sort of stops people from from learning something? It's just you know, at first you don't really understand it, and, and you just can't be bothered <laughs> in a way, or you think you know what this is something that I already know how to do in another software, or I you know I feel more comfortable doing it somewhere else. So why would I bother changing? And that's that's the problem. That 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 was my problem. That you know I would open, I would see a creature or something, and I I would go, you know what. I don't I can't be bothered because or can't be bothered learning that because I know I can do the same thing or something similar and I in my in my head was like um, I can do it a bit easier and faster just using the tools that I already know but of course once you you know open open your mind in a way to to let the to let the zero sheen <laughs> then um, you have you know you have a world of opportunities that you know, and, th and that was clearly the revelation. Anyway, that's a bit. <laughs> that's a bit of this story. But anyway, at the at the end, um, I stopped using it just because again I was using it purely as a as a tool to create normal maps. And at the time, I I felt it was just more like a two D tool or two point five D tool rather than a fully three D capable uh, tool. Again, it was just my my mindset. Um, so I just dropped it. As in, I didn't do much with it um, we had you know we had the option to use it but I didn't do much with it to be honest um, and then a few years later um, you know it, it was like already version maybe four I don't know I think I can't remember exactly which which version was it um, it wasn't too much long after but then I decided to, you know what, there's some amazing things coming up, um, coming out from Zbrush, and you know the Zbrush Central was was starting to to be pretty pretty active as a forum. So I joined and and I started, you know, pushing myself a little bit more in terms of um, what I could achieve. So again, for me, it was more like a like a change of a change of mentality. <laughs> I th I think that's Obviously, it's a lot of practice and a lot of uh, reading and a lot of you know watching. Like nowadays, YouTube and all of these um, videos provide like a, a genuinely good resource. 
uh, and you know there's amazing people doing training online and so it's it, it's a different time um, I remember th when I was studying this all I had really was the, the documentation like the actual documentation so I had to read a lot and test a lot um, and there were a few a few books or a few uh, PDFs and, and videos from from Nomon um, that we had access to like in the university library like actual DVDs I don't know if you guys remember what DVDs were uh, or are um, and uh, some PDFs uh, from from Ryan Kinsley as well um, yeah so those those are the things that I used as a as a starting point but I, I can honestly say that I would say 80% of the of the progress that I did in Seabrush or to learn Seabrush was that mindset just changing that idea it's like I need to treat this as its own beast as its own software and um, for what it's meant to be you know not not just as a as another tool like oh you know I can do this somewhere else and 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 to be honest that's how I treat most most things that I that I approach you know um, as a you know like a new thing that I that I want to learn All right, so <laughs> fully, that was just a, I don't know if that answered the question or if I branched out maybe too much. I'm gonna show you a little bit of what I've been doing now. Or like talk through what this part of the design is. Um, but if you guys have questions about, you know, anything else <laughs> that that makes me, talk no, non-stop like I just did um, maybe that's a I don't know I could give you some insights instead of just playing the pretzel what I'm what I refine this um let's see I forgot to save the, the morph target but hopefully you can see the difference uh, with all of these pieces and this is again just the the secondary forms we haven't you know got into doing the, the details or even um, the crevices or anything like that. So at this point, I think we're in a pretty good shape. I was hoping to, I mean, we're almost like 40 minutes in. So I'm, I'm hoping to, to show you the, the process. I might not get to do the, the entire thing, um, like fully detail and, and everything for both this piece and the, and the bottom one, but um, I think I can you know, I can show you the entire workflow and, you know, like I said, most of these, once you, you know the steps in a way, it's just a, a repetitive action. So, I uh, will, um, I will show you that. But yeah, hopefully you can see that this feels a bit better now. As a, like a solid piece, something that could exist as a single bone in a way I'll check the chat in just a second I've seen some activity there um, let's have a look let's do a quick save as well I'm going to upgrade my seed to Zeroish Core, to f uh, from Zeroish Core, of Zeroish Core to full Zeroish, and I was thinking about getting the key shot and bridge. Do you have it? If so, does it work well? Um, Mac Bubbles, uh, yes, yes, I, I, I would recommend it. Definitely, is something that um, it's worth um, checking out. It it just it is just convenient, not necessarily because of key shot. I mean, key shot is a powerful tool. Uh, but nowadays there's so many renderers that um, you know could do the same thing and, and it's just about the convenience really that uh, you have just a single button here the one that I just enabled there click BPR and it will send it to to Keyshot and um, there's certain things that you don't really have to worry about setup like if you use uh, surface noise you don't have to apply it to the mesh um, you send it to Keyshot and Keyshot will read it as a displacement so it's um it's pretty useful in that sense um, it's very convenient 
I've been recently using um, Maverick Studio, to be honest. Um, it's kind of like a fraction of the price of, of Keyshot. And um, it is amazing. I think it's very intuitive. This, this, there's certain things that you still need to, to tweak, but um, I think it's a fantastic piece of software. And all you have to do really is export whatever you're using or whatever you're doing here as an FBX. And from Maverick, there is a button that you can just import from ZBrush and it will bring Polypaint if you have uh, Polypaint, all the sub tools, and it can, it can handle millions of polygons as well. So uh, there are ten alternatives. I would say if you want to go for Keyshot and the Keyshot, the ZBrush to Keyshot bridge is purely the convenience of just clicking one button and send it to, to Keyshot. I still use it. Um, especially for work in progress stuff, um, um, I'm using it less and less as a as a final render tool, Keyshot, in a way, because like I said, I'm trying to learn all this stuff and and push, you know, get out of my comfort zone a little bit with other renders and um, other processes. But as a work in progress, like for example, the the things that I usually share after the stream, like this call, I would just click Keyshot BPR, send it to Keyshot, create a nicer render than uh, the, the simple BPR, uh, and then that's it but it's just purely the convenience really for me uh munchies hey uh where are you based i'm currently in lockdown here in melbourne <laughs> so um yeah in victoria uh no worries b thank you so much are you related to blender pablo <laughs> no is that a brain? I guess it could be a brain. Did you ever try Modbox? Uh, yeah, I tried Modbox. I really like the the layering system in Modbox uh, when I tried it. It's really really good. I'm, I mean, it's something that I tried ages ago, and I don't know at which stage it is right now. It's just I don't know. Um, it's it's hard to it's hard to uh, yeah it's hard to how how would I put it <laughs> nicely? It's hard to um, it's hard to change. It's hard to to go. <laughs> just trying to this do this in the in the best because uh, it is a good software. It is a very good software, um, and I know some people use it. I think um, Ian Springs was amazing artist. I, I think he does all the sculpting in Modbox, but um, it's hard to beat the process and the and the flexibility of Zbrush for me. That's that's really all there is to it. Uh, hey, comics legend. Uh, for many years, navigation and the interface of Zbrush limited me. Just have to push through the, kind of the second nature. Yeah, um, navigation and some, but but that's again part of what I was talking about. Um, yeah, about the mindset, because if you if you approach Zbrush uh, as a as another 3D tool, then you will get frustrated because you know how do you how do you move and and the then you know the user interface nothing like other software and um, you probably most likely get frustrated but once you pass that and and if you change the, your mindset in in a way um, you will see the beauty of why Zbrush is the way that it is because it's it is for an art it's, it's designed to be for an for an artist so uh, you know the names and everything so they call palettes instead of menus, right? Because they're meant to be a palette, like an artist palette, and you just have your things and you have your custom palette. So you, I have this palette that I build myself, pretty much like having a, a physical palette and put the things that I want to use. And and so in that sense, it's it's really well thought of. And I, I guess what you're saying, Comics Legend, is just about, um, for me at least, was just a mindset, just changing it and saying, OK, I'm going to start this as a completely new thing, it's, it's not a 3D software, it's not a 2D software, it's, it's something new altogether. Um, and nowadays it's just, uh, you know, a, a very comprehensive sculpting application, but at the time when I started, it wasn't necessarily. Um, and that I think that's another thing that uh, helped me, just sort of like, helped me to push myself in a way. All right, see, I think we are getting there. But as you can see, some of the the crevices and and yeah, some of the the gaps between the tubes that we generated before, they are gone, or they're very very subtle, 
and that's totally fine as part of the again we're not detailing and before we were not detailing so this is just uh, another stage of the process the whole point here is just to work on the transitions really um, Uh, that's actually a pretty good point that I struggle with to learn something you first have to throw away all the preconceived notion thing it should work exactly that's uh that's what I think <laughs> um no worries be glad that you that you find it interesting <laughs> what are dvds yeah the, it's it's an it's an old uh, rounded shape that the the eldest would know about um yeah <laughs> it's like usb like I, I haven't used a usb for for a long time and they were like the the hottest thing back in the day when um when i used to transfer files i remember the first usb that i had um my dad got it for me and it was it was pretty expensive and it was 128 megabytes that was like and it was like massive <laughs> I could I could place like a couple of scripts in there um, and take them with me. It was amazing. I don't know if it's the angle, but the the mesh is in really it's in very readable. Um, ah, fair enough. Maybe that's yeah. F first of all, yeah, I'm I'm working very close to it, um, and also I have it in solo solo mode, so. You know, if I bring in the other parts, perhaps it feels a bit more, more natural. Um, let's continue working here, and if you have any other questions, I'll, I'll check them out. Um, have you continued any of your concepts in VR? Um, not really. I wanted to do it. Um, I wanna really wanna keep working on, on VR because there's so many um, developments right now. But to be honest, between the between freelancing and you know getting getting any paid uh, paid gigs at the moment and the and the course itself the the extra mile that is and you know organizing a few things for the series for illustrators like I haven't really had any any time um, these uh, these sessions these series live sessions are, are kind of like my my time to to test things and practice things. Um, so I don't really have a lot of time right now to, or I didn't have much much time to play with the with VR. Um, but now that the Series Four Illustrators course is out, I have completed sort of putting that together. Um, the extra mile is still going pretty strong, and the and the students there are, are creating some amazing stuff. Um, so that's that's something else. But you know, fortunately there are, there are other artists that have already gone through the the process and they're already um, helping each other in the community so that um, that's also a good thing uh, at least for me that I can also spend more time on you know building up more content and, and that sort of things so I reckon to answer <laughs> to answer your question I reckon in the coming month months probably next month I would get back to it um, I have everything set up in the in the new place anyway so I will definitely get to it. Um, maybe another thing that is sort of has stopped me from doing VR because I did try it recently. Um, I I injure my my shoulder, so that's why I'm not in a in a. I usually do these streams in a standing position, but um, I'm not because I don't have support for my for my for my elbow, and the shoulder is kind of like injured the right shoulder, so. Um, yeah, I injured my shoulder playing tennis because I'm the I'm rubbish at it, <laughs> and I hadn't played for a long time. And I think when they lift the restrictions here in Victoria for the COVID-19, I I went too hard, um, you know, trying to make up for the um, the time that I didn't play it, and I injured my my shoulder. So I have a bursitis or tendonitis, something like that, um, and because of that. It is all it's all related, right? So I haven't done three D, uh, sorry, VR as well because of that. Because obviously in, in VR you your motion 
at the range of motion it's it's a bit more um, obtuse I guess there's a lot of move, a lot more movement so I haven't done that I remember the ZX81 PC with 8k memory ah uh, yeah that was another thing there um, when when I was studying the, there was something that it was in I can't remember the name um, and actually I think they were called like SIP or SIPO SIP not SIPOs SIP something and and they were like the new version of the um, USB-C sticks and they were like, super popular for like about a year or less and then they disappeared I don't know I don't know if you know what I'm talking about but that, they were like at the time they were like at this tiny orange boxes they were like flat and kind of like um like a Game Boy game and they were pretty pretty cool like you could save like a lot more uh, megabytes <laughs> um, still ridiculous if you compare it with where things are right now but I can't remember the name yeah zip disk I think thanks comics legend Berg, temp community rocks awesome yeah so the temp community is uh, what what Berg's um, talking about is the 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 extra mile community the temp community that we have is a private community for the the students of the extra mile and it is really cool and right now we're um, we're doing a pretty awesome um, student challenge because that's another thing that we do uh, we do student challenges within the community um, and this time the price is pretty incredible All right. I think we are getting there. This, I mean, this is a process, right? What I'm doing that could take a long time, and and you can look at it from different angles, and then go like, you know what, this this is not working, uh, and because it's still a dynamic, and you're still sort of playing around with the design, um, things can change dramatically very quickly, uh, as in how things are integrated. But I'm pretty happy with the with the primary shapes and the and the secondary forms anyway so I reckon I reckon we just stick with this and refine later but yeah, hopefully you see the you get an idea of what I'm trying to achieve so all of these crevices that we are losing, um, it's, I mean, it's, it, again, it's part of the process, but it's, it's not a big deal at all because the, the idea then is that we can take the knife uh, brush or the damn standard brush, and uh, once we do a better topology as a base, we can subdivide it and get a much better um, description of those details, so we don't have to keep increasing the the dynamic resolution, for example. So I'm gonna I'm gonna smooth these areas here, and I'm going to show you a pretty cool trick to work on these more secluded areas. We'll have to come back here to this to this area of the maxilla with the without solo mode so that we can see actually what what volumes need to be tweaked but all of these um, all of these lines can be easily integrated I'm gonna smooth them out and again I'm not worrying about losing details at the page because we're gonna redo them uh, certain things like these holes I think they, I was going to close them but I think they work they sort of like um, remind me of um, like having again it's, it's what I was talking about before um, of having something that resembles like a real um, like a real skull um, I forgot the name it's called the foramen 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 the one in the jaw is called the foramen 
yeah, the foramen for yep, I think it's foramen. Anyway, it's like those little dots that you'll see in the skulls here, oh. and it's also in the maxilla. Um, so you know these little things kind of resemble that as well. So I'm gonna leave them. But if you wanna get rid of those, um, it's very easy. You just since we still have Dynamesh, just read Dynamesh or use the inflate brush um, to close some gaps and, and read Dynamesh. If you're working with areas that are pretty pretty thin, um, you can also activate the back face masking, and that way you don't you don't affect the the volume uh, at the back or or get these really weird artifacts. Um, another reason I use this brush as opposed to any other the, any other brush. Let me just inflate this a bit more. It's because um, again this is just a version of the clay builder brush it's because at any point I can build a lot of volume very quickly and that's one of the, the keys of that brush really um, so if I find an area that needs a lot more volume I just need to press harder uh, maybe with a larger brush and create that that volume so that's what I just did there Just want to flatten some of these tubing a bit more, pressing the old key. So again, using the same effect of the builder brush, but pushing in. All right, a bit more work here, and I'll show you the the trick that I mentioned at the beginning. Well, that I was going to to show you at the beginning. Uh, which is working on those inner sections a bit more. Let me do a quick save. Um, again, when I am when I am exporting when I am export server subdivided object into Maya, my server subdivided mesh is not there subdivided. It's Dynamesh there, so I can export server subdivide file. Mm. That it that is a very specific question. You should like it's totally fine whatever you export from Sivrush it's whatever you're gonna get in whatever other application so if it is dynameshed um, you'll get that dynamesh if it is the subdivided version it will be the subdivided version at the subdivision level that you export it um, my I guess my first guess is just you're exporting just a subtool and you haven't selected the right subtool maybe so if you have multiple subtools and you have the Dynamesh version and you have the subdivided version, um, you might want to export only one and that is what's happening maybe, that you're selecting only one or you're selecting the Dynamesh one or have the Dynamesh selected and it, when you're exporting it's, it's going to export whatever you have selected. So maybe just check if that's the case and select the subdivided version but it, it, should, it should work just fine. think can move on now uh, we're gonna come back here to the to the teeth area to the maxilla but I think the other places the other the other volumes are working fine kind of like this area I'm gonna push this a bit more in holding the old key, smoothing that out. Yeah, the rest of the the surfaces I think they're working fine. Looks a lot more integrated. Um, I'm not entirely sure about this one though. Maybe a bit smoother here.
All right. Um, let's just do a quick, a quick rotation. See if there's something that needs to have a small volume to integrate better. I think for the most part it's fine. Yeah. All right, maybe here underneath, like I said, we'll come back to this. Um, but yeah, we need to, to work on these areas inside, so like from from inside of the of the skull. Um, so there's a, a very simple trick uh, or part of my workflow really that I use, uh, which is about flipping the normals. Um, what part of Melbourne are you from? So I'm in the metropolitan area, so uh, we we're locked. <laughs> we cannot move really anywhere. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's something that I was planning to do uh, when the COVID nineteen hit us, which was to do a a, a meetup like a Seabridge meetup or like an Addis meetup here. But definitely, if when this ends, that is highly that's high in the agenda, high high in the things to do in the to do list. Alrighty, so um, like I said, it's just about flipping the normals. That's all there is, and that's why I have it in my custom UI here at the top. Um, so if I make sure that the double is disabled for you guys, that should be. I'll show you display properties, right? Double and flip. So all I'm going to do is flip the normals. Make sure that double is off. Otherwise, you can actually see behind or like the yeah behind the single-sided polygon. So uh, make sure double is off and flip the normals, and it looks like really weird these sort of artifacts but um, you can see you can see a lot of this um, these regions and this part that looks a little bit weird if you just turn around you can see inside of the skull right so you know it works perfectly fine there are certain things like this that are like hollow so I can go with the inflate brush And inflate that, perhaps do a flip again, redynamish, just in case, flip again. Um, yeah, there's an area there that we, not, we need to uh, work from the other side anyway. But um, just by flipping, you'll see all of the the inside shapes a bit better so you can just refine them in the same way that we've been doing it but um, you can reach those those areas that are pretty hard otherwise the only thing to keep in mind here is that what you do in you need to keep in mind that it's an inverted version so you kind of like need to um, sculpt like a negative like a mold like a negative of a mold um, so whatever you use, like let's say if I'm right now, what I'm doing is using the normal uh, clay builder brush. Uh, so it's just building volumes, but when I flip it, it's gonna be um, reseated. It's gonna be an inverted version of this. So uh, just keep in mind that's that's what's gonna happen. But it's not it's not a big deal. So for the most part, what you wanna do here is work holding the old key, so pushing things rather than pulling them in a way. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I uh, just need to keep in mind that it's an inverted version. So once you flip the normals, then you'll have to, you know, come back to it. So I'm just doing a bit of a smoothing here that we haven't done. And smoothing these will also change the crevices once we flip it, right? Refining this area is kind of like hard because of what I just mentioned that you have to think about the, the negative space. But other than that, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward.
and because you cannot see the the other sides of the polygons is like you're not really affecting them so once we flip back again um, all the details and everything should still be there Um, this is another cool trick, maybe I'll show you that. So if I select the damn standard brush or the, the knife brush, what, I'm going to do it with a standard brush. Um, once you have the flip normals, if you press the Alt key, obviously to do it an inverted version, you can create very, very controlled and crisp uh, crevices in certain areas. So if I do this, right, I'm just pressing the Alt key when I flip and go back to the other side. Um, you'll see that crevice over there that's done with the inverted damp standard brush so this one right here so you can create something very um, very sharp using this technique and you can also use the move brush once you have something and then um, or deflate it so for example if I flip again go back to this one select the inflate brush if I inflate this like this Obviously, it's going to be pretty intense here. And then I can use the, the pinch brush, for example, and then pinch from this angle or from this side of the, the mesh. Maybe smooth it a little bit. Flip again, and then this is going to be super sharp and super, um, you know, very well defined. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's that. And I think uh, we're in a good shape to start detailing stuff. Um, just before we start, I'm gonna blend some areas. Just looking at from a you know from a distance, uh, there are certain areas that feel a little bit too intense in terms of detail. So I might wanna wanna bring this down a bit more. It's too there's too many uh, changes in volume. So I'm going to sim simplify this e even more, although I had some details there. And this is where I start like checking it from all the different angles. Still using the same technique, the same brushes. Clay buildup and smooth brush. Okay, perhaps even we're gonna lose this a little bit, but I think it's gonna look better. Lose a little bit of this line. How are we doing with time? Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, like I said, I definitely won't be able to get to the other parts um, or bring them to the same level, but it's the same thing. You you already seen the um, the process. Cool. Yeah, I feel I feel that this is still too much. So I'm going to try to simplify some of the volumes even more. So just filling gaps, filling, not gaps, but yeah, filling dents in a way. Um, maybe I'll change the material. So let's go to basic material. This is a pretty, uh, pretty good material to judge volumes. It's simple, basic, uh, but you can move the, the light and you will react to the light. So it's going to be easier to, to see certain, certain changes in volume. Uh, or you can use the basic material 
some of the ones that I that I have here that are custom made. Um, so they're kind of like clay materials, and they have a very sharp specular like this. Um, so that those are the materials that I sometimes use to to be able to judge the volumes a bit better. But any any you know the full material that has a a high specular in zero will do the trick. To be honest, I think is this eh, not really, but there's certain areas that are drawing the attention too much to this, uh, and it's like losing the the flow a little bit. So maybe what I'll do is integrate this a bit more. Yeah, I think that should work better. Yeah, I think that works better. Okay, so I think that was my problem. There was kind of like a visual line that was cutting the flow too much. So just refining the volumes here. There we go. That's it. So that yeah, that definitely looks much better. Um, I don't know if you can tell the difference, but it was mainly this this region that felt a little bit too crowded with with details, um, or, or with not details with secondary forms. So I want to refine them a bit, and then uh, I will add a lot more details later. But um, you know, high frequency details rather than you know the forms. So I want the, the forms, the secondary forms, and the primary forms, the the original shapes to be working before I add details. Then I can add as many as I want, but then, you know, changing this later on is not going to be as easy. So I need to make sure they work, they work just fine before moving on. All right. Still need to refine this a little bit more. Let's have a look at the chat while we refine this. Um, have you ever or will you ever revisit an old piece and update it or will you just let it go and move forward? Um, I think non -inten like intentionally I wouldn't I prefer to just start from scratch over again and just work on something new. Um, however, sometimes I do, you know, I clean up the, the, the hard drive, I need more space or, or whatever, and I start looking through, like, I have a, I have like a thousand folders core, called sketch or idea or, you know, concept. <laughs> so if I go into those, and that's the problem with um, being a bit disorganized in that sense, um, I would open it and just to see what it is, sometimes doesn't even have a name uh, and you know I might find that it's a really cool idea or that I think it's a cool idea at a time and that's when I go ahead and do you know what maybe let's refine it uh, but it comes more from you know that I forgotten that I had that idea and then I I think maybe I should revisit it but not not intentionally as in I don't have a folder that I call all ideas that I need to revisit that's that's never gonna happen for me <laughs> I, I just move forward, but I do revisit certain things. Like I said, when I find, uh, when I find the time, uh, sometimes it's not about revisiting ideas. Like all ideas, is more about, you know, you put things in hold and you just come back to it. But uh, you, or at least myself, I I know that I wanna, you know, finish. For example, the the character that we did a few streams ago, the Zibo Tuki, the little, um, the little. Star Wars character thing. Um, that's something that I want to finish, but I want to finish it in a specific way. And I know that right now I don't have the time, so I have it there. I know that I'm still working on it. I just put it on pause. I know, um, so I will revisit that one at some point. Um, but other than that, I, I don't have that that sort of drive to go and take something else that I did in the past as a sketch or as an idea and revisit it. I will just, if I like the idea. I will do something new with it. 
I don't know if that answers the question. Um, how much time do you take to finish uh, one project for freelance or studios? Uh, it depends. It depends. It 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 varies. I mean, it it varies because of the type of project. Um, what I do is that I have a daily rate uh, for freelance, so I just charge based on on my day of work, really. So. Um, and what I do is I have a I have an application called the um, it's called Toggle. So I have I have that application permanently on the on my desktop. And what I do is I try to log the hours that I do with everything, not just when it's paid work, uh, but with everything. So that way I kind of learn the the amount of time. Like I can track my time and I can learn how long it takes me to do something um, and then based on that I can just say you know what I don't know if, if a studio wants me to do a concept right but it doesn't have to be full body character right or yeah let's say that it's just a, a creature idea before moving into the full concept or whatever um, I know that that specific job will take me a specific amount of time right uh, and I can say you know I can do this in in a day or I can do this in in half a day or I can do it in two days um, because I have that sort of track record of, of what I can do and and I say look this is my daily rate based on the amount of work that this is for me this is uh, how much I would charge um, based on that daily rate so I guess that's a, an, an answer most about the how I would charge rather than how long it would take um, but yeah it, it totally depends on the it depends on the job really so obviously a sketch like this or a concept like this I'm I'm spending a lot more time here uh, for a couple of reasons once I'm sort of like showing the process and, and talking about different things that I would know how to do straight away without uh, necessarily talking you guys through it and and also uh, yeah the fact that I'm just talking it sort of like takes my mind away from from this uh, sort of creative process and, and more production focused process so it just takes a lot a lot more time uh, but in you know in other circumstances uh, I can work a little bit faster so it will take less time um, so for example I did a if you go to my Instagram page, um, which you know you can go, is well, hang on, here. Yeah. I'm like in a mirror. There we go. This one, Pablanda. If you go into um, Instagram, the latest thing that I shared is kind of like a time lapse of uh, adjusting a shape for a head, and that's a tutorial that I'm working on. That took about 40 minutes, 45 minutes to to do that. Uh, and it's obviously a speed up time lapse, but I wasn't, you know, I was just with my headphones listening to music and just doing that. So that is just to give you an idea of the of the time frame, I guess, that something like that would take take to make. And of course, there's there's certain things that, like for instance, if you have a project, um, and that's something that I, that I've, I've I've experienced and I'm. I'm currently experienced with a current project that I'm working on, but let's say you have a, you have to develop, I don't know, five characters or five concepts. Um, the first one might take longer, and the following ones might take less time. Right, and that is just, you know, because you get into that um, flow, or you have, you know, you establish your own uh, rhythm, creating your own workflow for that specific project or you adjust parts of your workflow to that to that project so that you can work faster um, so it really depends on the project it's, it's hard to tell how long things work um, most of the time when people ask me about it I, I just say it takes me about you know 15 years 16 years 10 years uh, because it is just a way to say like it, it really depends and it's, it's all the time that I've ex spent my life sort of studying and, and researching and testing and practicing and getting to know softwares and learning um, all of that has a obviously it's is the is the core right and makes an influence on how long you take to do something so um, 
you know, just telling you that I can do something in an hour or half an hour, it's it's a bit. I mean, it's a, it's a straight answer, but it's a it's a bit um, deceiving because uh, the only reason I can do it like that is because of all those years that I've had, um, you know, of experience really. So, sorry, not a, not, a, not the most straight answer, I guess. <laughs> no worries, mate. Glad you like it. Um, is this skull in the upper right corner an add-on? No, you can just make your own. Let me just show you. So if you have this, like this is the, the skull and I want to have it here. I just had it here as a reference because, you know, I can see, I can click it and rotate it in different angles. And I can see, this is the, I don't know if you can see it there. Maybe this is too small. This is the little, the fossum, the foreman. Forum, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's uh, it's the little dimples, the foreman, foreman, foreman. Those little dimples here that I was trying to sort of replicate here and perhaps around this area. In a way, like I said, they're just hints of realism. So I, that's why I have it there. But uh, you can definitely change it. So I have a few of these that I've made myself, like this skeleton, just to have like proportions when I'm doing characters and. Um, anyway, you can create your own. So if you have this one like this, let's give it this color, um, a black background, just so that Sirius will read that black color as a transparent object. And then you can go to preference, you go to cam view and click on make cam view. So Sirius is going to take uh, like screenshots in different angles, um, different elevations, and then we can just switch back to a gray color. And now we have the icon there at the top right. Right and yeah, you can uh, you can change the size. You can click next to move between them. So that's why I have it here in my in my UI. But it's that's pretty much it, really. Uh, let's go back to solo and yeah. So all right, let's um we have about half an hour left. So we're gonna spend the rest of the the session today um doing some you know defining some details with other brushes um. So, for that, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this. Get out of solo mode. So, I only have the top area enabled. And what I think I'm going to do... Um, actually, before I do the, before I do the um, remeshing, what I'll do is I'm going to bring in my knife brush. And I'm just going to... sharpen some some of these crevices that I'm perhaps I want to have a bit more prominent and the reason I'm doing this is again not necessarily to create details straight away however having these these crevices like this um, it would help in the in the serial meshing process so that um, series knows you know how to place the the loops a bit better so just just sharpen certain things a bit more that I perhaps want to have, you know, more details. Yeah, this is not details. It's purely to to be able to guide the serial mesh a little bit more. Um, just sharpen the difference between you know the angles, I guess, of the polygons, and that will help with the the retopology. Just to create specific, you know, loops. Yeah. Uh, actually, what I'll do is I'm gonna bring in the teeth, and this is something that I need to, you know, work on maybe with a standard brush. Just work a little bit more on this before we do the remeshing, just to make sure. Oh no. <sighs> well, it lasted for an hour and a half today. Um, so the thing is, hang on, I lost my um, tablet thingy, so that's annoying. No, 
don't have to work with the with the keyboard So all I'm doing here is just using the standard brush to sort of create these gaps where the where the teeth would be. So they they sort of feel more more naturally embedded. And that's just with the standard brush, nothing else. And of course the smooth brush. Um, what I'll do is I'm gonna save. I know I have um, about half an hour. I'm gonna save because doing these details without the tablet is a bit uncomfortable. So I'm gonna save and I will reset this. So give me two seconds. I'm gonna reset everything and I'll come back in just a second. Alrighty, so we are back. Cool. So working again. Um, so yeah, all of this is just so that it feels more embedded. So this is what we were doing before the drivers crashed. Just adding a little bit of volume here. I guess we might have to separate these bits somehow mm, I probably should spend a bit more time in this area as well but I reckon I reckon it's fine we can just move on to the details otherwise this um, this will be too boring Alrighty. So um, what I'll do is I'm just gonna make that there. Going to turn that off. All right, duplicate. So I have two of the same. Turn one off, and for this one, I'm gonna turn on polyframe. I'm gonna give it a single poly group. Doesn't really matter. I'll change the material so you guys can see at least a bit better. So it's a pretty dense dynamesh. Um, I'm gonna go to the Siri Mesha, so Geometry, Siri Mesha, I'm gonna leave Adaptive on, this is uh, this is gonna be crucial for this 
specific sketch because there's a lot of um, difference between you know um, I'll show you what this means so all of these areas right here that have uh, very sharp crevices in a way even these ones right now um, uh, compared to let's say this area right here or areas like this one here or even inside right um, ZBrush, if you leave the adaptive on, basically what it's going to do is, like the name says, it's going to adapt to the changes in the topology. So it's probably going to use, you know, a larger set of polygons here because it doesn't need that many polygons to, to describe the surfaces, but it's going to adapt in certain areas like this one to create smaller pieces, right? So that's what the adaptive really is doing, is just adapting to the topology so that it distributed the size of the polygons a little bit better. If I leave the adaptive off, then what I'm gonna get is a more consistent set of polygons. So I'm gonna have, you know, Siri is gonna try to maintain this size of polygons across the entire model. Um, so it's gonna be faster, but I'm gonna lose a lot of the the details here or a lot of the the bases, the base mesh that I need <laughs> for this area. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna make sure adaptive is on. It's gonna take longer, obviously. I'm gonna click on half because I'm gonna reduce the amount of polygons. I have symmetry enabled, and I'm just gonna click zero measure. So it's gonna take a little, little while, but hopefully not too long. If you guys have any questions so about this process or anything else, feel free to put them in the chat again, and I'll address those while we wait until this produces a, a better topology. Because we have to probably do it a couple of times. So the first time is just to get the first pass of topology to simplify it, but I, I want to reduce it a bit more. Um, it's not going to be like a, the lowest res or anything. It's not going to be for a game engine or anything, but you know, uh, I just want to have more a cleaner topology so that the the details that we're going to add um, they feel better um, and there's less artifacts because we can still push the um, the resolution of Dynamesh a little bit higher, but when we start doing very high frequency detail, very small details, you it's not going to be enough, and you're going to have to, um, yeah, you're going to have to work around certain things because you're going to have the you know certain artifacts because the topology is what Dynamesh is doing is basically like a grid, right? It's not there's no flow, so doing those type of details that have a flow, uh, like crevices and things like that, is going to be pretty hard. Uh, symmetry works with zero mesh. That's right. So uh, right now, what I'm gonna get uh, this this mesh is symmetrical anyway. Um, so what I'm gonna get is a symmetric um, mesh, which I don't know gave me some weird things here. Don't know why. Maybe it's too stretching. Like I said, all of these. This is actually a pretty complex um, object for zero mesh because of the you know all of the loops and the bridges, I guess. All of these holes and everything, it becomes a pretty complex shape. Let's just try that again. And remember, we have like four different algorithms to do this. If it doesn't work, it doesn't really give me anything cleaner. Um, what I'll do is I'll just show you the, the detailing process, and ultimately, uh, then I'll have to do a, a bit more of a manual retopology or something more, you know, more manual, more accurate. Uh, but we have four types of uh, sear meshes, so you have the the serial measure just clicking once, that's gonna be the main kind of like latest algorithm, like the serial measure 3.0, I think it is. Um, if you hold the Alt key and press the serial measure, that's gonna give you an alternative algorithm for that 3.0 version. Um, if you click or enable legacy and then click serial measure, that's gonna be your third type of uh, serial measure. And this one might actually be better for this because it's it's more for organic shapes, I think. Um, or in my experience, it's work it works better. The previous algorithm works better as as an organic shape. Though now it did a, a pretty good job. Um, and the fourth one is holding the old key, serial meshing one the uh, once the, the legacy 2018 uh, is working. So um, what I'll do is I'm just gonna smooth. Don't know why it's giving me this these shapes here, but I'm just gonna smooth them out a little bit. Everything else, I think it works, it works well. Um, so let's just go ahead and do another zero measure. So it's gonna reduce the topology even further. 
um, the more obviously you do it, like the more uh, serial meshing you're doing, the faster it should get in theory, just because, you, uh, especially if you have half enabled, because it's just reducing the amount of topology as well as uh, simplifying the, the mesh uh, a little bit. So it should get faster in theory. <laughs> But again, I, the the reason I'm doing the retopology or, or using serial measure is just because I have, I want to have a cleaner topology to add the details, not because I'm planning to you know create a, a super low res or anything like that. Um, it's purely for detailing. So this one definitely looks much better. Very very decent for the complexity of this mesh because there's a lot of bridges and stuff and actually looks pretty pretty good so um, just to give you an idea of what I'm aiming for and, and what I'm trying to look here um, actually let's, let's change the, the color so I can show you with a different one all right so um, when I start adding the the when we start adding the details like um, crevices and things like that uh, I'm going to follow a certain flow, so I'm going to add details like these, right, probably maybe like that, just creating some cracks and crevices in there, same thing here, all of that, um, sort of like following the main shapes that we have already established, right, If and and this is what I'm looking for in the, in the retopology, that there are certain loops that follow that pattern, so you have these loops that go all around these, right, even from here, then you have these other ones that go all around there. Um, these ones, of course, it's kind of like in a spiral, right? So all of these loops, that is exactly what I'm that I'm that what I'm after. So that I can act, that I can actually once we subdivide it, um, there's a as a clean there's a clean line because there is a, a clean loop flowing through those uh, through those lines. I don't know if that makes much more sense, but once I get into that um, detailing you you'll get it alrighty so um, what I'll do is I'm gonna turn on the other one uh, I'm going to project everything solo mode so now the this is a little bit sharper which is great so let me just show you before and after I don't know if it's gonna make a huge different difference but Let's do Shift S there. Go back. Right. So yeah, it's a bit hard to tell. Maybe around here, you can see that the the projection really helped. All right. So um, you don't have. To, this is another cool thing, right? If you if you only have two pieces enabled like this in your subtool palette, like I do have, um, you don't have to have this solo mode off you can still be in solo mode and series will project whatever is visible uh, not visible whatever is um, well whatever is enabled in the in the subtle so the solo mode is just a preview of this so now what I'll do is I'm gonna divide this a couple times maybe one at a time so divide it once project everything so you see it projected that skull even though I was in solo mode I'm gonna divide it one more time project all You know, the more you subdivide, the, the longer it's going to take to project. Now I have about 1.2 million uh, polygons. But I think that's really all we need. Yeah, in terms of projection, I think we got all the crevices and everything. Uh, but now we can, you know, start adding the details that we want because we have a cleaner topology. So I'll give you an example of the the reasoning behind this now. So if I want to do this this line, maybe here, maybe we can do even more. So if I subdivide one more time, five million polygon, right? This line here, at this uh, at this level of subdivision, in this area, it looks a lot more uh, a lot cleaner because there is a flow, right? Even even though I'm sort of like deviating here from the from the flow itself let me just do it a little bit more thorough right I'm sort of like following this line 
Um, it's going to be a lot cleaner than if I do it in here because even if I keep adding more resolution just because um, there's no there's no flow in the topology so hopefully that makes sense and that is the reason I did all of that all right cool so let's go ahead and start adding some you know some details and some crevices uh, this is going to take a, a lot more time uh, than what we did before so I reckon in the last 15 minutes I'm just going to show you a little bit of the process and and then work um, later on, on other stuff so I'm going to use the this custom this custom brush uh, which again is kind of like the, the standard brush so you can do this with the standard brush and I'm just going to start adding these lines in here and the idea with these lines from in terms of the I mean from a design perspective um, I'm also holding the alt key as well just to push things in um, is to create some kind of ornament pattern um, in a way so this is is bone or, or the idea is to have a bony material but there's also some some sense of a of an ornament um, I don't know if it if it is clear but you know, creating these things sometimes it makes it feel that it's not necessarily um, an organic, like natural thing or a natural occurrence, but more like a manufactured. So it's even though everything is organic, it it has a design, um, a design choice. Someone made that that choice. Someone sort of created that design. Um, so it makes it feel less of a of a natural occurrence, I guess. That's what I'm trying to achieve here. And now because I have a lot of um, resolution, that's when I can switch to the smooth uh, stronger, maybe switch the intensity a bit more. And that's that's gonna help me maintain a very smooth surface while I add those details. So what I'm doing now with the with the smooth brush is really um, a smoother transition between whatever I add and where it finishes or where it ends, where where it starts and where it ends. So this is kind of like the beginning of of the details I would still consider these kind of like secondary shapes uh, because they affect uh, the volume slightly more than high frequency details uh, but you know it's uh, for me the way that I see this is almost like there's this two stages of the process and each stage of the process uh, or sculpting and detailing um, sorry like there's two stages that's how I think about it there's two stages the first one is sculpting the second one is detailing the sculpt, but within those two stages, there are three uh, major things that you might want to keep an eye on. So in the first one, you have primary, secondary, and tertiary shapes. The tertiary shapes is almost like uh, what I'll be doing with this uh, with this process, uh, but it's also the beginning of the of the detailing. So just to make things complicated um, in my head, basically the this this stage of adding this sort of a uh, large details is kind of like adding the primary forms of the detailing stage i don't know that's probably not gonna make a lot of sense but that's um that's how i see this this process so it's not necessarily like high frequency details i'm still affecting large portions of the volumes uh, but um yeah it's it's just starting to to define i guess the flow and, and the lines that i'm gonna follow with the details because like I said uh, I've said it this many times during these this streams um, details is uh, it's just a very it's very easy series allows you to do very very simple stuff um, sorry detail very complex stuff with very simple processes so um, I wouldn't say that um, that should be the focus the focus is on making sure that everything feels you know that the design is solid basically so 
that's why this process takes time and that's why I wanted to so like show it to you guys and um, yeah and put emphasis on the on the workflows and the stages of the process all right maybe we can start with something a little bit more intense a bit sharper we have about 10 minutes I want to do a few more of these and then show you um, you know the effect of some custom brushes so you can see that once you have this established then adding the details is going to be pretty pretty easy because you're sort of like following guidelines that you sort of created beforehand like what I'm doing right now uh, could be viewed as as the guidelines And, but I'm, I'm also need to, you know, in this in this process, I need to make sure that these lines they don't read as a, as a fall or as a as a wrinkle, because the, you know this is a this is a bone, so it doesn't. You know, that's why I'm doing these sort of like uh, weekly lines towards the end of, of certain pieces, so that they don't feel like like falls, because there's no there's no meat around here this is just purely you know cracks in a way so we need to um, define the material with the sculpting not with the texture or anything like that uh, and then that, that's something that is pretty important as well uh, especially when you're doing something like cloth or uh, I, I, I have a, a short course about clothing in, in ZBrush um, which you know I talk about this in there as well but it's basically that idea that if you want to create, uh, I don't know, like a leather jacket or something, uh, sculpting it, you need to make sure that the the sculpture and the folds and the you know memory folds and uh, and all that they they actually are part of the sculpting, so that without any texture or any material, you can understand that it's it's a leather jacket or it's, or that's the material that you're going for, and then the textures obviously they're gonna sell the effect. Because the the way that um, you know the way that leather works or deforms, like a thick leather, for example, compared to linen, is gonna be way different. Um, so the the major forms and the secondary forms they will look a lot different. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Um, hey Paolo, that looks great. Thanks, mate. Um, is there any way we can find your brushes? By the way, yeah, all all, all of my stuff they would be either um, most of the these sort of like brushes resources are in the Seabrush Guides website. So if you go to the Seabrush Guides, they are all there. They are all the brushes. There's a, an actual a section that's called Seabrush brushes. Um, there's heaps of uh, free stuff that you can get there, and I don't know if that's the question or you're asking about the the actual brushes that I'm using right now. <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, if, if it is just, uh, you know, the clay brushes and, and the things that I'm going to show you in just a second, they are all part of the ZBrush guides. Um, so you can get them from there. Yeah, this is something that definitely needs definitely need more time working with these um, these pieces. But um, I'll show you what I'm gonna do in a second, and that will give you an idea for the details, which is 
ultimately what I wanted to show. <laughs> show. Uh, but we, I mean, all of this process is not, um, it's not just waste of time that that's necessary so that we, you know, we can spend um, less time doing the, the details. Like I said, they're pretty easy, but we are confident that, that the rest is working just fine. All right, so let's just do the the detailing now. Um, just before I do any of that, I'm gonna add some crevices here. Well, not crevices, more like bumps with a the standard brush that I mentioned at the beginning. We can even reduce the intensity a bit more. So it doesn't look as detailed. What I'm going to do now is uh, go to the layers, create a new layer so that I can, you know, go back. Because this is, again, um, just to show you the to complete the workflow, but I still need to spend a lot more time in this stage. Uh, but I can use, you know, um, custom brushes. So let's go to brush. So I can use something like the rock brushes. Uh, this is something that is not just for rocks. I mean, the, the effect that it produces is close to, uh, you know, what you could see as bone. So I'm going to store a morph target. Uh, maybe this is too intense. I'm going to flip. So I'm going to use this C sub. That should be a bit, yeah, a bit more subtle. Whoops. So even in these areas that look pretty, pretty clean, um, these custom brushes they uh, I play around with the with the depth. Um, so it's kind of like an auto masking technique or an auto masking feature, not technique, a feature of the brush. So I can do this this sort of stuff very quickly. And I'm doing it without really thinking too much, only just trying to follow uh, the flow that we have established with the with the secondary forms. But I'll I'll show you why I'm just doing it a bit, you know, a bit loosely. Uh, basically, for two reasons, or yeah, there are two features that allow me to be a bit more loose uh, applying this thing. One is that I'm recording a layer, so I can control the intensity of what I'm doing. And I'm also using um, morph target, so I can control where or refine where these details are. I'm gonna maybe use another brush. Uh, let's. Uh, which one do we have? Let's try this one. So this one, yeah, this one is gonna give you a more, more of like a crater effect. I'm doing this very quickly because we are running out of time. Um, but um, yeah, even though I'm doing it very fast, um, we will be able to control more of a, um, you know, have a lot of control over this because of the morph target and the and the layer. Um, let's see which other one we can use that could be interesting. I have another one. Uh, this one is. You can get it from the series guides as well, which is free, the double action brushes. Uh, this one, the CVG's creature uh, damage carrying, uh, this one would be a, a cool one for this specific type of bony creature, maybe with a larger brush size. So this one, yeah, you can get this one from the from the series guides. It will have a, a larger impact on the topology so it will change things uh, underneath a bit more but you know it's still pretty pretty useful I'm gonna switch to 
the smooth peaks so that way uh, when I subdivide I can leave all of those little bumps as you see there so that starts to you know show the the power of having established having going through the process and establish all of that and now just having more freedom of you know actually just adding details without worrying too much about why or not why but in, in what order or following what flow you're um you you're adding them so this one creates a very bony surface this is the one that um I don't know if you're familiar with the one of the the works that I did a, a while back um the Frankie character so I developed these brushes for that character so all the scars um all the dimples on on that creature they're done with this well not all of them but there are actually a few brushes related to that creature but you know they produce this very interesting effect so that in combination with the, the smooth peaks it produces that sort of more bony surface How are we doing with time? I think I have to wrap it up now. But again, this is uh, another another starting point of the the details. Um, I would, you know, spend more time in here, uh, making sure that this is working fine. But even though all we did was just, you know, a quick pass, you can, you, you know, you start to see the the value of esta um, establishing all of the secondary and primary forms first and then just going very quickly adding this detail. Like I said, this is adding details in Zbrush is so easy because it's, yeah, it's really easy. Just uh, you can use custom alphas or, you know, download alphas. There's a bunch of stuff uh, for this type of um, effect in the in the Zbrush guides. So you can go ahead and um, get those. And then you know, feel free to to share what you what you do with them. Um, okay, so this is eleven. So I'm gonna show you a couple more very quickly, and then um, we, we'll just leave it there because yeah, we are running out of time, or we ran out of time. So this is another one. This one will change the topology quite a bit, but it sort of like pinches the you know. So maybe maybe it's a good one for um, you know for these areas. And the trick with this one is that you have to go over the same stroke uh, a few times just so that it creates that effect. So I'm just gonna do it here just to show you how it works. Um, maybe exaggerate this line here and. We'll wrap it up there, guys. Um, just one more thing before I go, actually. If you go to the, the Morph Brush, remember I have, uh, where is it, Morph Brush. I have I have stored a, a Morph target before I started doing the, de the details and I have a layer. So with the morph brush, I can just go to place, let's say, certain parts that you know that are like more the outer side of the of the volumes in a way, and then just refine that. And it's kind of like an eraser tool. So I will just erase this back to where it was in certain areas, and just leave the the gaps that I that I find useful or that I like. So all of these details, I can just actually smooth that out. Bring in the morph target and and use that as a as kind of like my eraser tool. So it's a, a pretty quick way to add details. A pretty quick um, technique, I guess.
So again, it's just morph target, smooth brush, and having the layer later because let's say this is the first sort of like pass of details. We already have you know some some interesting shapes going there, but we still need to to work on that uh, on that a lot more. So the layer allows me to sort of tweak that. You know, let's see how much of these details I actually want to add. So just one, let's say 0.5, like 50% almost. Uh, and then add another layer and then just you know keep iterating but let's leave it at one so that you can see the the effect clearly and what i'll do is i'm going to turn on the other stuff i'm going to take the original put it in the original folder and this is what we have right now cool all right guys i'm going to leave it here hopefully um you like <laughs> or you find this useful uh, are these edits destructive or can you total them on and off? Um, not, yeah, it's just a, a layer. You can turn the layer off and then delete it if you want to or just turn it off and then use another layer. The thing is, as soon as you have the first layer of sculpting, uh, if you want to keep adding more stuff or reducing or removing stuff, you need to create new layers. So that's the only, that's the only downfall. All right, I'm going to leave it here, guys. Uh, Got to go now. But um, yeah, I'm going to leave it here. Hopefully uh, I'll get, <laughs> this might be one of those projects that I just leave there. Um, I might get to detail it and, you know, do a, a quick render later on because uh, I think it's, uh, I kind of like the design. So I'm, I might spend a little bit more time fixing it, but the rest is just the same. It's just adding details and spending the time. Um, we'll see how we go. Maybe we can continue doing that later uh, in, in another session or otherwise we start something new next time. Um, cool. And just before I go, if you, again, um, for those who ask about the, the series for illustrators, uh, course, uh, let's see, where do I have that? I'm just gonna let you know where that is and you guys can have a look in and if you want. So, yep. If you go to the Sirius, uh, sorry, the 3D Concept Artist website, or even if you go to Sirius Guides, it will be a link to this course there. Um, so you can just go to the 3D Concept Artist, and it should be this first link. And it's it's um is a recording. There are the recordings of a live workshop that uh, went really well, uh, of how do you Sirius with Photoshop to create this comic style illustration. So it's something you know slightly different. Um, this is the it's basically the the workshop where I created this um, this artwork. Um, yep. So I just made it available. So for those of you guys that um, were asking about it, it's ready in case you missed it. Um, I sent an email about it, but in case you missed it, it's just going to the three D concept artist website and it should be there. Cool. All right, guys. Uh, take it easy, and I'll see you next time.